Let's begin by closing our eyes and coming to a comfortable posture. Feel free to adjust your posture anytime. You notice patiently waiting for the sound of the gong uh, uh, disappear. It would also help us to take a deep breath in, your shoulders going all the way up and dropping them. Do this a couple of times so you start feeling the way the relaxation settles in in your body. <clears throat> Another deep breath in. Dropping your shoulders now. Exhale. One more time. Doing that a couple of times. Asking your body <clears throat> if your body is comfortable. Your feet up. Wiggle your feet, you know, your toes. Notice the soles of your feet. Slowly going upward. Your ankles. Adjust the muscles on of your in bones, your knees, thigh muscles, sitting bones, up your spine, lower back, mid back, and upper back. Keeping a straight line all the way up to your neck and adjusting your neck as well, allowing it to rest. On the other side of your back, you notice your breathing patterns. Chest rising and falling. Your abdomen rising and falling as well. And your shoulders rising and falling gently. And that is Actually, a natural rhythm of your breath. Now, to your face, nostril, where air goes in and comes out. Your eyelids, basically thousands of muscles there. 
Now beginning to relax. Your <clears throat> forehead and top of your head, back of your head, left ear, right ear, the entire part of your body up above your neck. Now you recite the hands and their position, not too tight, not too loose, not to leaning backward or forward, just keeping an upright position. You hear sounds, your awareness is resting, and equanimity kicking in as you do this exercise. It's also not knowing what will arise next. Every moment is very, very different. Feelings come and go, some difficult, some neutral. <clears throat> some thoughts, if you pay attention, million things are happening. Sense of this atmosphere. sense of calming, bodily sensation. Let us apply mindfulness to your breathing. Mindfully you breathe in through your nostrils all the way down to your lungs. There's this air filtration process. Some of it is known to us, some we don't know how. Once the air goes in, the body the biology takes care of the rest. This unconscious process has given us life, ability to do things, energy and everything, good health. This is arising a sense of gratitude, this thanksgiving, Mindfully, you breathe in. Mindfully, you breathe out. And that means your attention may be focused on where the air touches your skin inside your nostril and staying there observing the air flow happening right now, not in the past, not in the future. It is a process that is happening at this very, very moment.
when your mind wanders away, you come back to your inhaling and exhaling, gently placing your attention there and staying fully present with that experience of breathing. You may as well notice the starting point of your breath and the ending point of your breath. When the breath becomes a delightful experience, mind may take delight in staying there with it.
Okay. Hope you had a good meditation. <clears throat> this morning, <clears throat> I've been thinking of this. I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, I googled because I did not know the answer. <laughs> Is Buddhism against psychedelics? You know, what Buddhism thinks about psychedelics? And then I saw somebody talks about is Buddhism against pleasure? Um, and the answer there was very brief, but I like the way they responded to that question that um, Buddhism says that there is no end to satisfying our desires. And that is true. Um, and same with pleasures, any pleasures that we, except for meditation pleasure, <laughs> or the pleasure of attaining Nibbana, I believe. <laughs> but those are not constructs. Uh, the, the last one is not a construct. The Nibbana pleasure is not a mind-made thing. And that is a philosophical question. But the rest, you know, the way that pleasure works, the, especially with drugs, you know, the body asks for more and more and more, and it, it kills people in the end. Um, and what next? So then teachings of the Buddha put people into a cycle of birth and death, and there is continuity after that for them, new form of body. And it's hard to know if they are in a delusion afterwards, uh, especially if they died overdosed. I have not developed meditation enough to know what happened to them after death. But it occurred to me in this meditation that there have been monks who can cure an illness by, through meditation. Someone goes and talks to the monk and says, my sister has this problem and so she's not even in front of me, the monk, but somehow the monk is able to. So th that kind of that is a different kind of meditation, which you know, not everyone is able to do that kind of thing in meditation. Um, anyway, so the way mind works is very important uh, in terms of understanding pleasure in Buddhism, uh, as you know, I was telling in yesterday's midday meditation, uh, something like, you know, when, please don't imagine the gross aspect of it, that when two people <clears throat> hit each other, they close their eyes. And if you think about it for a moment, it is the imagined person they, they kiss. It's a mind construct, that the illusion that it is the image of this person in your mind. That, and then the pleasurable feelings or stuff. And then you are, un, you know, sub, um, controlled by those feelings. You, so that illusion that the mind creates yeah, is everywhere is everything. <laughs> um, and a less gross example would be to think, you know, when you think about your mom, she exists. In what form? Um, an image of a mom or not necessarily an image, it's just a concept of the mother. And uh, but what we imagine and what she is doing right now are 
two different things. So we live in an illusion that she exists another time. She's on her own, doing her own, her own things, and if she's right in front of us, even then, we only see what we created of her in our mind. There's a delay in processing the image of her, first of all, uh, how an image um, is perceived through seeing. And there is also never seeing. It's only a mental image that we keep seeing. Image that we form <coughs> based on the outer. So, same with hearing, smelling, and everything in the world. Very, very <coughs> delicate thing to know. But Truth lies in that area somewhere. There, yeah. an imaginary world that we have built is somehow based on these desires, delusions, and uh, those desires as dislikes, things that we don't like. You know, we refuse them. So our world is based on based on that. But I opened this because um, this, this came to my mind. The Buddha says something like, "Wanang uh, chindata um, marukang." Don't don't cut the trees, but uh, kill the forest. This is. Um, have you heard of that? Yeah. So, okay, let's. Uh, Let's learn from that today. It's uh, <clears throat> the story of five old monks from Dhammapada, verses 283 to 284. Um, the Pali goes as, Vanang chindata marukhang vanato jayati bhayam chitva vanancha vanathancha nibbana hotha vikhavo Yavang van Yavang vanato ne chijati anumato pi narasanarisu Patibad manova tava so Vacho kira pakova kira pakova matari. So the English is you understand all Pali, right? <laughs> the wood cut down. Cut down the wood, but not a tree. Since it is from wood that fear is born. Having cut the, cut wood and woodedness, O monks, be without a wood. So wood here means, you know, desires. The wood cut down, but not a tree. Actual trees don't cut them, but the wood of craving. Because craving brings about fear, fear of losing, fear of not being able to prove, or fear of making mistakes, all these, all these, all kinds of fears. Having cut wood and woodedness, woodedness is the, the nature to crave. O monks, be without wood, be without craving. As long as there is woodedness of a man to a woman, uh, as long as that woodedness, that nature to crave is not cut, um, the bondage arises. It's like between a mother cow and a calf. They each get, you know, seek one another. Uh, so, let's read more. 
Um, well, I will also read the simple translation here. O monks, cut down the forest of defilements, but do not cut down the trees. Fear comes from the forest, forest of defilements. Clear both the forest and the undergrowth. Having done this, achieve the state of Nibbana. So this undergrowth is, um, again, the woodedness, that there is sleeping defilements. At the end of meditation, we may think that, oh, we are free from craving and now I'm in Nibbana, but there is sleeping. You know, we put them to sleep, but they arise when conditions arise. That's the danger. <laughs> the next, as long as a man's mind is attached to women, women even minutely, like a little undergrowth that has not been cut down, so long will his mind be attached like a suckling calf to its mother cow. So that is showing the biological nature of things. That it's, There's nothing to blame here. Hormones working, desires working, it's just the reproduct, the, the way the world works, the way the world is designed to work. That the Mother, son, um, mother, calf. There, there are other mothers in the entire universe, like sloth and the sloth baby. They each, they each have that bondedness. I've seen these videos of how, you know, they grab onto each other. For us, it, it may be an ugly thing. For some people, it's not actually. But the ugliest thing to us is not ugly to you know, to like between dogs and some, it's only rarely someone would put their mouth and kiss a dog, but it's just gross to us. But between their groups, it's not, between dogs, it's not like that. So it, it, it's desire, but nobody knows how that bonding works. I mean, it's just biology. Anyway, there is a story. Because the more I talk, it gets weirder. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I better read the story. You ask a question? Yeah. So something I've been thinking about recently yeah. is, and you were talking about, you know, at the beginning, like, fabrication, mm -hmm. or the idea that, you know, the picture of the mom or the picture of anyone else is, like, something that we create. Yeah. I struggle with the word fabrication, which I think is a, a word that a lot of people in Buddhist communities mm. use, because there's like, to me, there's some like negative connotation of that, mm -hmm. which I think I understand why that word is used, but it also is like some of that fabrication, at least from my experience, is like useful, and mm. uh, that like when I am most defabricated mm -hmm. or whatever whatever that means mm -hmm. uh it's like uh you can't really act from that place mm -hmm. um in that you know when i like completely drop stuff like it becomes uh like hard to act i guess um and so i'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on it does feel that like there is fabrication that is quite useful. Hmm. And I struggled with the idea that it's like all about like getting rid of fabrication hmm. um, when it feels like there is fabrication that is, well, there is like simplification is maybe a, a, you know, a different word that I think I connect with more than fabrication. Um, and that like, it is impossible to fully know my mom. Like that's like not something I'm ever gonna fully know. But some amount of like simplification does seem to make it possible to like be compassionate to her mm -hmm. um, versus like always striving to fully know her. Uh, yeah, and that's just something I've been thinking about that I'm curious. 
very um, useful question. Um, some of the things in the universe is not known to us, and I believe there is a reason for that, like our past lives, um, or uh, ability to read someone's mind. Unless you know you develop certain abilities, you are not able to access them in this life. Life ends before you even develop any of those skills. Um, and fabrications, the Pali word for that is Sankara. And Sankara also has a negative uh, meaning to it, that it is Sankara, the mental construct that runs the world. Um, in that, there's, I think, um, understanding in Buddhism um, that those are needed for conventional life, that mental constructs and act, you know, doing the right thing, for example. Um, making right decisions, meeting right people, making like an engaging in an occupation, all these things require a certain um, fabric fabrication. And at being able to act quickly also is part of uh, this. We can't empty our mind and go to a job and say, oh, I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> what email? <laughs> that is impossible. <laughs> that would be the last day of your work. <laughs> um, there's also, um, of course, um, I don't think like I would ever want to know fully my mom. Right, that is also not something we. It, it, it feels like invading her yeah. life. So we we know that we all respect her for the mother, and um, um, but when it comes to enlightenment for monks, not for necessarily for lay people. Actually, we need to draw a line there. That some of these teachings speak to to those who are very seriously cutting delusion. Um, and they are either monks or close to that state. Um, monks not just in body but also in mind. You know, they need, their desire is to know the fabrication fully well and uh, especially seeing the delusion behind them, ignorance behind them. Uh, you know, when you really know the ignorance, the, the del you know, any delusion behind anything, the desire is not so strongly present in our mind. It vanishes. There's no way that that desire can stay for certain. You know, it, it's like um, again, children, cars. You know, you you wanted them so badly when you were little, and now you know more about them than you. I will give one to you. I say. Why do you give this to me? It's painful. <laughs> now that you have one more thing that is given them. And, 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 and the way that you look at it, oh, it's something that Bhante Kusala gave to me, so I should keep it. So it's not the same value that you gave to it as a child anymore. It's, it's a different value. So these are fabrications that are harmless, but there are ones that can be harmful to us. And all of that is mind-made. This is why in, in the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha says, Chittena Niyati Loko. Loka is the world that 
mental world that we each have built, it is run by the chitta, the mind. So, that uncovering the nature of this mind and delusion that the mind, you know, shows to us, uh, in that fabrications, learning about fabrications, how 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 they are built and how we can um, see their true nature is important to us. It becomes important to us. I think when you start to see a couple of fabrications, major ones, lust, hatred, delusion, then you can apply it to, it to everything else and see, oh, that's so true, that's so true, that's so true. And the, the way that it works, that understanding works in us, is that you are more equanimous, you are not acting in anger, you are seeing the truth behind this, that even when someone uses abusive language directed at you, you don't really get shaken by it. Because it's what your mind makes of it that affects you. To a Buddha, though, he did not have Devadatta, his cousin, as an enemy. It was just, it didn't cross his mind that way, because he did not construct an enemy in his mind. There's so much power that you can gain about the world that is full of delusion. Uh, otherwise full of delusion. And that is very powerful. And he then, he was able to direct it to other directions for helping people and so on. Not only a Buddhist thing though, it is found in other saint tradition that they, they developed their mind. Some, some learned it very naturally, easily through you know, less meditation, but some need to do a lot of meditation to, to do that, to be able to do that. Did I answer any of <laughs> your question? You did for me. Hmm? You did for me. <laughs> well, something that I took away from you, what you said, I don't know if you said this or not, but <laughs> this is what you inspired in me was that when you see something as, men as mental construct, it like, has less uh, power over you. And that allows you to then yeah. have the ability to like move in mm -hmm. a way mm -hmm. that is less driven by that mental construct. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you are then to take up that mental construct, you're able to apply it in a skillful manner mm -hmm. as opposed to like being driven because you don't understand the mental construct. Yeah, very, very much so. Especially dealing with anger, for example. When, when anger is gone, that is a really good, good life. Good sleep, good waking up. <laughs> uh, less frustration about the place you slept or the mattress or whether it is the floor or anything under a tree, it doesn't matter because the mind is not complaining. <laughs> yeah. It feels like a dream state to be, but you know, people did that, made it over. And when I started, you know, of course, at 16, I was very clashing with my dad, not listening to him. And and then at that age, I became a monk. I can't have that attitude <laughs> toward him. And now it has changed over the years, like anything else. But the way... He and I have, he's a Buddhist monk now. And uh, yes, yeah, my, no, he hated me when I became monk for five years. He did not talk to me. But now he is one. 
and the way that we have bonded is very different. His meditation and my meditation and our understanding have transformed us to be very different beings in each other's minds. <laughs> Not that it's a fairy tale all the time, but we can notice easily when it gets difficult, we step back and give space to them. Yeah. Anyway, maybe I will not get to read the story here. <laughs> no problem. Kutula, can I ask? Why do I see you becoming a monk? Dukkha, suffering. Suffering, seeing suffering everywhere. And also seeing happy monks. Smiling and happy monks. But after I became a monk, I know they were faking it. <laughs> There's a lot of Dukkha as a monk also. <laughs> <laughs> Like Ajahn Brahm says, you know, he when he was a novice monk, he thought he should be a big monk, so he will not suffer like a novice monk. And then he became a big monk, he started seeing big monk suffering. That's true, actually. Monks smile and you know, they, they do that, they are pleasant to people, but there is a lot of suffering underneath. And they need to, they are working on it. The study suffering and, you know, community suffering and maintaining a temple suffering. <laughs> There's more than a household sometimes. <laughs> Only you know, notice, start, start noticing. But not to discourage you to become a monk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good life. <laughs> good thing, the porch suffering. If staying in the porch suffering is <laughs> <laughs> We enjoyed it a lot though. Really? Yeah, sorry. <laughs>